since we were last here, I thought, okay, this is where we're going next time. And I had all these plans, talk about this, talk about this, talk about this. And when I started to write them down, My, no, still there. We'll go there another time because my mind went down a completely different pathway and I had no intention of going down there. And so I have assembled a handful of thoughts that may seem a little disjointed. If they are, you just sort them out. All right. But first, I want to tell you about Texas. Remember, earlier in last year, we organized to, to, to mail out through the mail system 240,000 copies of The Perfect Storm to 23 cities across Texas, across the state of Texas. To date, Elmira handed this to me yesterday. We have made arrangements for 160,000 Point eighty-eight. <laughs> so somebody's given that 88 cents. That's how it, sometimes it works out that way when you take it through PayPal. So we have that much money, that premium. Yes. And that costs a dollar a book, so that's 160, dollar a book. That's 160,000. 60,000. And a, and a point we eighty-eight. That that has been yeah are in the process of being mailed. So if my math is right, all we need to finish this off is another 80,000. And we will have this done. Now, now, those of you beyond the camera, I know some of you live in Texas. And I know some of you did live in Texas. I know some of you have an interest in Texas. And if you want to help us get this finished before we go on somewhere else, and we'll talk about that another time. But if you want to help us get this finished, $80,000 will mail 80,000 books to 80,000 homes in the remaining cities. As I recall, we've got Austin, whatever. Makes your toes tingle. Oh, tell you what, Charles, what a blessing. I mean, what a blessing by God's good grace. I think we would have to say God is interested in the work. These seeds, I mean, they'll last in the warehouse, but you know what? They're better in the soil. 160,000. I could give you all the figures. Um, I need to sow a seed with you too that we are looking toward Cuba once again. And it's off in the distance just a little bit, but um, they're ready for more. Bless their hearts. And this next lot that we're going to send them will bring the numbers that we will have sent into Cuba, almost a half million publications. I want to hear a hearty amen for that. I mean, that is just unbelievable. Now, we could share all the details with you about how to go about that. We're not going to do that. But we'll talk about that more when the time comes. Nine? Someone look that up. I think it's nine. Nine or twelve. What's the population of Cuba? Uh, yeah, that's that's what we're looking up. Too many. And not enough. Right? Our island, that's a lot of people. It's big. It's the largest island in the Caribbean. Is it really? Mm-hmm. Spanish speaking, the whole island is Spanish speaking. 11 point, 11 and a quarter million people. So they might have had a baby or two since then. Wow. All right. Our scripture is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. And you're going to look at this and say, oh, where's he going with this? Verses 19 and 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Know ye not 
that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, there are all kinds of rabbit holes we could go down with that particular verse. But let's talk about, remember a few weeks back we said, let's talk about prayer. Today, let's talk about love. Love. Most of us, at some point in our lives, have been forced to consider the concept of love on all kinds of levels. I love has prefaced many of our statements since we can first remember. I love my teddy bear. I love my doll. We evolve. I love ice cream. I love pizza. I love my dog. And on. The idea of love really should not be confused with desire or well-wishing. It is those things, but it's also so much more. In God, love is goodwill, and love is benevolence. The love of God in us produces goodwill and benevolence. So let's cut right to it. What's that got to do with that verse we just read? Love, by its proper definition, puts the interests of others first. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Love is not necessarily selfless in the sense that I don't matter, but where love is, there is less of self. Love not only wishes well, love works to make things better for our fellow human beings where we can. We can't save every starfish that gets washed up on the beach, right? But you can save that one. You can help that one. You can feed that one. Love works to make things better for others, even if I gain nothing for my efforts. And we have a word for that. We call it altruism. Love is not a gift of the spirit. But the fruit, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 say, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, the fruit, the first fruit of the Spirit is love. Love is perhaps the first thing we understand that cannot be seen, touched, handled. But it has a fruit. It's like gravity. Gravity holds everything down. You can't see gravity. You can't touch gravity, taste it, handle it but it has a fruit. The fruit of gravity is holding things together. Now we understand that God is first love, but God is also a spirit. Like I said, forgive me if my thoughts seem to hop a little bit. Exercise some patience. God is also a spirit, and the presence of that spirit produces a glow, which we call light. And we also call that glow fruit. The presence of God in the beginning was uttered in a handful of words. Let there be light. A light that was different from the glow of the sun, because the sun, according to the record, didn't appear until three days later. Because God is both the originator of the Spirit and the possessor of the Spirit, we understand by implication that God has the ultimate fruit of the Spirit. God is charitable. He gives to those who don't have and never will have, if left to themselves, the things that they need for life. 
Now, right here, I want to just inject something and consider the concept of Sabbath. Now, this is something you can't touch Sabbath. You can't taste Sabbath. It's, it's a, a capsule of time that God has said, this will be a benefit to you. And just recently, somebody sent me a very short video. It's just a short video, which I am going to share with you. You don't have to see it, but you do need to hear it. I'm going to share with it, share it with you on my phone. And you just... I've ever come across in sermon prep, okay? So these sociologists, they were studying the happiest people on earth. And one of the people, groups of people they found were the happiest on earth are a group of people called Seventh-day Adventists. These are people who are like, it's in the name, a little sect of Christians that like they are religious about Sabbath keeping. Like that's their whole thing. Okay? And here's they found, one, that they're the, some of the happiest people on earth. But number two, they found that uh, Seventh-day Adventists, now I'm going to say a number, and I need you to highlight the number in your head. It's going to be really important in about 30 seconds. Seventh-day Adventists, they found, live on average about 11 years longer than the average American. Okay? Now, I want to show you something. And I, I'm going to actually do it on my phone because I want you to see that I'm not cheating the math. Okay, so I want to show you this. All right, so the so Seventh Day Adventists live. Remember that eleven years. They live eleven years on average longer than the average American. Okay, now let me show you something. Okay, in America, the average lifespan right now is is wait not not one. You're you're gonna live past one. I hope. Okay, the average uh, lifespan is seventy seven years long. Now, what we want to figure out is, okay, but how many days does somebody live? So to figure that out, obviously 365 days in a year, so we're going to multiply that times 365. That comes out to the average person lives 28,105 days. But here's what I'd like to figure out for the purpose of the sermon is over the course of that time, if a person always kept the Sabbath, how many Sabbaths would they uh obey how many sabbaths would they observe okay so to figure that out there's a sabbath that happens every seven days every seven days there should be a sabbath so we're going to divide that by seven and we're going to find out that over the course of an average person's lifetime they should honor 4015 sabbaths now that's really interesting so i'm just curious i'm just curious if somebody honored a sabbath every week for their entire average life. Actually, how many, let's, let's put it instead of days, let's get it in, in years. How many years worth of Sabbaths, if you took the Sabbaths and turned them into years, how many years worth of Sabbaths uh, did, did they observe? And to do that, obviously, we'll divide that by 365, and that comes out to exactly 11. <laughs> now, some of you are like, I know this is supposed to be a big deal, but I don't know why. Okay. Now, let me explain this to you, because all the math people are silently going, that's insane. That is insane. Do you see what happened? Is these people, they observed, uh, they observed 11 years worth of Sabbaths over their lifetime, and God added, on average, el exactly 11 years to their lifespan. That's amazing. That is mind-blowing. Now, do you see this? Essentially, what happened in their lives is God went, every time you give me a day, I'll give you one back. Oh, oh my goodness. That, was very that is more to it than that. You know that. But, oh, my goodness. Now, this man is obviously not a Seventh-day Adventist. But he's making an observation about a behavior that is, I mean, talk about statistics. Huh. Now, that's crazy. Now, obviously, not everybody gets to enjoy those extra 11 years. And obviously, not everybody gets to enjoy those extra 11 years equally. But, 
oh my goodness, day for a year and all that kind of thing and 6,000 years of history and six days of work and one year of Sabbath and one day of thousand years of Sabbath. Whoa! Whatever you think of that, God is in the business of giving. And if he gives something like Sabbath, I mean, we won't lose anything, really, by not keeping Sabbath. But we will gain so much more if we do. Does that sound like convoluted thinking? just seems to me, if you do what God says... There is a blessing attached to that. It might not make any sense to us. And it does make no sense. It's just a period of, of time. Whatever. God is the absolute omnibenevolent. He is love. He has love to give. And he glows with the light of love. This is a love that defies description, just like gravity. A love, this is a love that cannot be captured by words. How many of you remember Johnny Cash? Remember Johnny Cash? <laughs> he had a hit with the song in the early 70s of the last century. Sounds scary when you say it like that. And it went something like this. Now, I should preface this with, there are many good thoughts and many passages of Scripture that wind up in, we call them pop songs, country songs, whatever. They wind up in songs in the minds of the songwriters and they slip right into the modern vernacular. Burt Bacharach, for instance, died several days ago, okay, responsible for some of the biggest, most successful portions of music and song that, wow, this, this did not come from a heathenistic writer of songs. Without love, we are nothing, he wrote. Nothing at all. Anyway, wasn't where I was going with that. Johnny Cash comes up with this song, A Thing Called Love. You can't see it with your eyes. Hold it in your hand. But like the wind that covers our land, strong enough to rule the heart of any man, this thing called love, can lift you up, never let you down. Take your word, world and turn it all around. Ever since time, nothing's ever been found. That's stronger than love. To which I say a hearty amen. The love of God cannot be painted on a canvas or signed out by those who use their hands and fingers for speech. The fruit of God, the fruit of the Spirit of God, is first, number one, second to none, the world premiere, love. Now, this spirit is easy to identify in yourself. And I believe scripture will bear this out. Love will cause you to think benevolent thoughts towards our fellow human travelers, to wish for them to succeed in their path heavenward. Every thought you've ever had in the past, you wished somebody would fail or not get that or not do that. That didn't come from God. Never has, never will. God doesn't even think that way toward the devil, though he would wish that he had taken a different path and was not on the path that he is now. He wishes no ill will toward the devil. Love will cause you to do more than think good thoughts towards others, to do more than just wish them well. 
Love will cause you to put wheels on your own prayers for others. Anything less than that is really just a face we keep for going out. Someone has said that the love we have in our lives will be demonstrated by how we treat and think toward those we like least. Someone has also said that human beings, all of us, are full of something and we leak. Recently, Cindy and I had the pleasant task of replacing the dryer vent pipe under the house. Ever had to do that? We tried to clean it, got one of those fancy, it was so bad off, it just tore the piping up. So we had to replace it. We opened the crawl space door and the first thing, first thing we are met with is a drip from the joint into the water regulator for the house. Just a drip. 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 One that would be more trouble than it's worth to fix. You know what I'm talking about? Just let it be. It's just a drip. Now, if the water pressure were any higher, though, the story would be different. A steady stream would begin to flow, which would slowly wear away a bigger gap. Eventually, this would be more than noticeable and it would cost a lot of money, first to manage and then to fix. It's a lot like when the water pump is going out on the car. Perhaps it starts with a squeak or a grind. It's still pumping, but it's noisy. Best get it fixed while we can, while it's convenient. <laughs> Right? Because when the water pump goes out, you're dead in the water, pardon the pun. So you replace it. Next thing you know, a radiator hose blows or a heater hose. Maybe you spring a leak around a gasket. Now what's happened is you've replaced that old pump with a newer, more efficient one. The water pressure goes up. Not a lot but enough to expose the weaknesses of the rest of the season. You know how this is, Charles. By a similar token, the human being is a lot like a pressure cooker. The heat comes on and all kinds of good things begin to happen inside the cooker. But the cooker has a vent whereby just enough of the pressure is let off, which prevents the cooker from exploding. The cooker leaks by design. Now, just like we read in our opening scripture, we are vessels created for the habitation of the Spirit of God, which produces fruit, which is designed to be a blessing to our fellow human beings. And we are designed to leak that spirit. Now, if we're full of something else, we're going to leak that, too, by design. Now, some of us are good at wearing faces that we keep in a jar by the door, ready to be put on when we go out. We have our shopping face. I was living in New York. I've got to tell you this. I was living in New York, and I was going for a job that was in Central Park. And to get to it, I had to take the A train. Not the A train express, but the A train local. And I was in the South Bronx. And I took the A train south. And I mistakenly got on the A train express. And it took me all the way down to the bottom of Central Park. And I thought, ah, I'm young. I was like 20 something. I'll just walk, you know, rather than wait for another one another train, I'll just walk. And so I ended up walking all the way through from the bottom to the top of Harlem. Now I'm a young Caucasian, okay? And I'm really out of my element. And I thought, uh-oh, uh, by the time I realized what was going on here and how I was being viewed and stared at, 
it was too late to go back. I was safer to go on. So I put on my Harlem face. <laughs> right? And my attitude, my Harlem face and attitude. Okay, don't mess with me. And I walked all the way through Harlem. And it was uneventful. But I had a face for that. We had our work face. We had our parent face. Our sober face. Our night out with the friends face. We have our school face. We have our church face face. Now, the love of God is not a face. It's a fact. It's a fact that produces a face by design. If the love of God is in you, you will not successfully cover that up. No matter how hard you might think you would try, you will not successfully cover that fact up. And eventually, if, we were all, if all we are is full of ourselves, we will not successfully cover that up either. So when the heat on the planet gets turned up, even a little is going to be a drip coming out of us. And when the pressure gets really high, I mean really high, we're going to start leaking a lot. Pressure is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not something God is afraid of. I mean, he can keep the atom together. So much so that if you were to actually release what's going on inside the atom, you'd level a rather large area, one single atom. God is not afraid of pressure. If we're full of dirt and selfishness, it's going to leak out. But praise God, he has a way of dealing with that and getting rid of it right now. If we're full of love, then praise God, he has a use and a place for that. And a place where that fact can be the most useful. Wherever we might find ourselves when the heat gets high will not come as a surprise to God. I believe the scripture will bear that out in the life of the Hebrew Joseph, who was a fitting illustration for this reality. Joseph, perhaps, gave it very little thought. But the record in the book of Genesis is that Joseph's Egyptian master, Potiphar, first took notice that the Lord was with Joseph. Those words. Next up, the keeper of the prison takes note of this new spirit in the land. The record in Genesis 39 reads thus. Verse 21, 39, Genesis 39. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. <laughs> and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. Joseph made arrangements. Verse 23, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Now circumstances became such that Joseph one day stands before the king of all the land, Pharaoh himself. And Pharaoh sees before him something different. Not a smelly prisoner brought from the bowels of the palace pit. He sees before him a vessel who is leaking the wisdom and love of God. Now, Pharaoh might not have put it in those words, but it doesn't matter. History will bear out that the children of Israel were saved because a leaky, godly vessel was in the right place at the right time. Joseph found himself on an Egyptian street called Straight by the divine arrangement of God. He got past being what we might disrespectfully call a brat. And from then on, at every point in the life of Joseph, when the heat got turned up, he leaked 
what was in him. And people noticed, a heathen people at that. And when the time came for him to get even with those who were responsible for him being there, he leaked again. Let's read this. Genesis chapter 45, verse 4 and on. You remember the story. There's a famine. The brothers go down to Egypt more than once. And before long, they're in the prison. And Joseph knows who they are, though they don't know who he is, because by now, time has gone on. He's grown. And we change as we grow. But there comes a moment where Joseph chooses to reveal himself to his brothers. <laughs> and we don't want to, we don't have to think hard to picture the scene and how they must have felt about that. But this is how it played out from Joseph's perspective. Joseph said unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I'm Joseph, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now, I imagine at that moment, their hearts fell through the floor. But he says, now, therefore, be not grieved. You could tell he knew they were grieved. Don't be afraid, we might expect an angel to say. Be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. I mean, I don't know about you, but that is a powerful story. The brethren of Joseph expected to get what they should have expected to get. But Joseph was full of something they didn't expect. And just like the rest of us, he leaked. Whether it be water, air, or spirit, when the pressure rises, it's going to leak out of its container. Our lives right now are nice and calm, relatively speaking. Okay, we've learned to deal with these circumstances, right? Things have changed for us, all of us. You might not believe it, but I usually have dark, curly hair, lots of it. Things have changed, yeah? Things have changed. I used to be able to run around more than I do. I used to ride a bike, push bike, bicycle, up that hill in the mornings and in the afternoons. I haven't done it in so long, I'm not sure I could do it now. <laughs> Things have changed. You know, these, David spoke of three score and ten. You were telling me about that earlier. Three score and ten. Seventy years. And I've heard this more than once. Once the clock ticks past 70 years, something changes. Something in us changes so that 60 and 10 are not just 70. 60 and 10 are, oh. right? And he goes on to say, and if it be four score, it's hard work. 
Now, living those extra 11 years, that I can't remember his name that this man spoke of. Wouldn't it be nice if they could be healthy years? And you go to bed one night, it's your 81st birthday, and you go to bed one night and you just fall asleep and don't wake up until the resurrection. Unfortunately, it doesn't go that way. While we're here, it's sad that a lot of us, we get to that age where we start to get a little less lucid here. You notice a lot of people get nasty when they get older, grumpy, grouchy. Now that is not installed in them. It's always been there. Being kept under control by the Spirit of God. Once the Spirit of God is not so much in control, we leak the rest of that stuff that's in us. We are broken human beings. But what we want to do is leak good stuff. And I guess right now is the time to be, I mean, we can't grow the love of God. We can't produce the love of God. The love of God is. And if it's in us, it produces fruit. It causes us, if it's in us, it causes us to do some things. And if it's in us, it causes us to not do some things. You are the, how did it read? You are a vessel. You're the temple of God. You're a vessel. We are created as vessels of God. And we were having a conversation about a gun. A gun is a hurting contraption. Until it hurts somebody, its mission is unfulfilled. It never lives its potential until it hurts someone. That's what it's designed for. We are designed to be receptacles, vessels, temples for the Holy Spirit. And if that Spirit is in us, I honestly believe that's the only time we will ever have a sense of fulfillment. <laughs> we will have reached our potential. We will have lived for what we were created for. All right, let's let Jesus have the closing word here. This is found in John 13. He says in verse 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye cast out many demons, if ye heal many sick people, if ye raise the dead, if you keep all of those Sabbaths, if you understand what happens to people when they die, God will know. Men will know that you are my disciples if not any of those things if you love one to another. For we are brethren. And that is a good closing thought. Amen. Heavenly Father, we know this love is elusive to us. But we know it's real. We know it's a fact. We know that this is who you are. And I pray, Lord, you would just come into my life in this fashion. Can't speak for anybody here. Speaking for myself. Please, Lord, do this for me. Let me fulfill the life that you have given to me and waste not the years. Lord, it's raining. Roads are wet. Till we will see each other again, I pray that you would keep us safe, 
and blessed. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 